Christianity's great dilemma. Is Jesus coming again? Or is he not? By Glenn L. Hill. I'm reviewing this book. It's a very hard review. I think it would take me about seven, eight, nine thousand pages to review all the misinterpretation errors. So I put things here and there. I cut excerpts from it that gives the mainstay of what he's saying, that Jesus Christ has come by A.D. 70. The second coming was then. And it has nothing to do with the church later on, after A.D. 70. Second coming is already there. Excerpts from this book that I'll, I'll present in black font, followed by a response in blue font from the website BibleStudyManuals.net, which is me. The first area of concern, which I think is vital, once we settle on what Matthew 24 means, we pretty much have an idea when Jesus Christ is going to come again and what that entails. Matthew 24. This is from chapter 2 of the book entitled, In the Gospels, When Did Jesus Say He Was Coming? On page 19, Glenn Hill reports as follows. Jesus' answers to the apostles' questions are what Matthew 24 is all about. If we can see this basic fact, then we can understand this chapter. Matthew 24 is all about the judgment Jesus had pronounced upon his people. From history we know the Roman armies completely destroyed Judea, Jerusalem, and the temple by A.D. 70. Matthew 24 is about the things that would be happening in the coming years from the time Jesus made these prophecies in A.D. 30 until the end came in A.D. 70. This will become clearer as we continue our study. So, that's the beginning of the book. Chapter 2 actually goes on a little bit in the beginning. Uh, this is the anchor of the book, Matthew chapter 24, and then the corroborating passages that show Matthew 24 and the Old Testament, Revelation, speaking of the same events that accompany, precede, and follow the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 24 is a study that I did on this book as a term paper when I went to seminary. In the introduction I said, when will the massive temple buildings in Jerusalem be utterly destroyed? What signs will be evident when he is coming? What signs will mark the end of this present world system? Chapter 24, and for that matter chapter 25 of Matthew, contain our Lord's answer to his disciples three questions about his appearing as the Messiah King to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth and the events surrounding this appearing. When read and taken in the light of all the passages related to the doctrine spoken of in our Lord's answer, we then have as clear a picture as possible today of the events leading up to our Lord's return and of the destruction of the temple. Author John MacArthur aptly describes the Jewish mindset at the time that the disciples asked our Lord their questions. The MacArthur New Testament Commentary, Matthew 24 to 28, Moody Press, 1989. MacArthur goes on to say, In the minds of the Jews of Jesus' day, so the time being ripe for Messiah's coming, they had suffered persecution and subjugation, the Jews, for many centuries and were at that time under the relentless power of Rome. When John the Baptist appeared on the scene, reminiscent of the preaching and lifestyle of Elijah, the people's interest was intensely piqued. 
And when Jesus began his ministry of preaching, with unheard of authority, and of healing every sort of disease, many Jews were convinced that he was indeed the Messiah. When he rode into Jerusalem on the colt, the crowds were beside themselves with anticipation, and they openly hailed him as the Messiah, the long-awaited son of David. At that point, however, Jesus' ministry rapidly and radically departed from their expectations. According to their thinking, the next steps would be the gathering of the nations against the Messiah and his dramatic and effortless victory over them. That idea apparently was also still in the minds of the twelve. Jesus' many predictions that he must suffer, die, and be resurrected had simply not registered with them. In some way or another, they either had discounted those teachings or had rationalized and spiritualized them into being something other than literal, physical, and historical realities. In fairness to the disciples, the Old Testament also saw, the Old Testament prophets also saw the Messiah's coming and establishing his kingdom as a single event. The church age was a mystery to them, a mystery, as Paul explained, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, Romans 16, 25 to 26. Because Israel had obviously experienced tremendous tribulation, because Jesus declared himself to be the Messiah and identified John the Baptist as his forerunner, and because he had accepted the messianic claim of the people a few days earlier, the disciples understandably thought that the sequence of events would continue as they expected. They were now certain that Jesus' next move would be to demonstrate his inexorable power over the nations that would soon rise up against him. Millennial Kingdom Further answer to this excerpt from Glenn Hill's book requires a careful, detailed reading of Matthew 24 as follows. And we will go there. Now I'm going to read a little bit further before we click on Continue. Note that this study will now answer nearly all of the points made by Glenn Hill, who has totally missed the mark on Jesus' coming again. It did not happen in A.D. 70. That's his agenda. Mine is not to nitpick on small words, but nitpick on the overall description of the events preceding and at the time of and following Jesus' second coming. Let's go to the continued button. Matthew 24, 1-3. If you're going to start looking at Matthew chapter 24, you've got to start at the first verse. Glenn Hill doesn't do that. We read the excerpt, but he doesn't go verse by verse by verse. So get an adequate description of what we're talking about here relative to Christ's second coming. So Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings, the buildings, the grand buildings of Herod's temple back in the first century. Do you see all these things? he asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They're viewing not what the New Testament has to say about the dispensation of the church and the Lord's second coming there. They're looking at Old Testament. Remember, New Testament was not written yet. They're looking for, for a beginning, the end of the age of, of Judaism and the conquering and the, of, of Rome over the Israelites 
and Jesus Christ coming again, the Messiah, a Jew, bringing in his kingdom, millennial rule, kingdom, actually they're looking at it as an eternal kingdom of God. Our Lord has just finished speaking strongly to those Jewish leaders, finishing with a statement that the house of Israel will be left desolate, will be left to waste. Take a look at what he just said. I'm going to move her over to get the letters there. So let's jump back to Matthew 23, 37 to 39 to get a better handle on the context. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. He's talking past tense, referring to the future. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is talking about his humanity. And he said, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So a short thing is going to happen, which did, a couple of three years. And then he disappears from the planet. And we'll see how that comes about. This message did not immediately sink into the minds of the disciples, for as they walked by the awesome and magnificent temple buildings, they called his attention to the wonder of those buildings as if our Lord had not spoken a word, especially a word which would adversely affect those very buildings. Bible Knowledge Commentary. John MacArthur says, perhaps expresses the disciples' mentality, what could possibly happen to such impressive buildings, especially to the temple of God? John MacArthur states on this, as they were leaving Jerusalem, the disciples came to point out the buildings to Jesus. The other two synoptic gospels point out that they were pointing to the temple in admiration, saying, teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. We have Mark and Luke corroborating. It goes on to say, The temple and its adjunct buildings stood on the top of a mount. A massive retaining wall on the south and west sides helped support the mount itself as well as the temple. The temple was awe-inspiring by any standards, but to a group of common men from rural Galilee, it must have been a breathtaking marvel. They could not conceive how such an enormous structure could have been built or decorated so magnificently. The Roman historian Tacitus reported that it was a place of immense wealth, and the Babylonian Talmud said, He that never saw the temple of Herod never saw a fine building. Some of the stones measured 40 feet by 12 by 12 and weighed up to 100 tons, quarried as a single piece, and transported many miles to the building site. What an undertaking, even, even for now, but then even more. The disciples were perhaps wondering how such an amazing edifice, especially one dedicated to the glory of God, could be left desolate, as Jesus had predicted. As Jesus continues to walk away from the temple and toward the Mount of Olives, he brings his disciples back to reality when he responds directly to their awe about the temple buildings. Matthew 24, 2. See ye not all these things, in other words, do you really see everything? Not only the buildings, but what is going on in the world around them. Note that the Greek word for things is neuter, whereas buildings in the Greek is feminine, thus indicating that our Lord is not referring to the buildings, but to his earlier discourse about the house of Israel becoming desolate. Verse 2, Verily, verily, I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. Scripture records no further conversations, especially between the Lord and his, and his disciples, from the point of time in time when Jesus began walking away from the temple until he sat down somewhere on the Mount of Olives. That is to say, little of import was said after he prophesied the temple's utter destruction. He went through the eastern gate of Jerusalem, crossed the Kidron Valley, and then finally ascended the nearby Mount of Olives, and sat down. Gave everybody a lot to think about. During this time of travel, the disciples...